Check. Ah. Okay, I'm proud to announce you, uh, Markus Nutzing and uh, uh, sorry, I'm proud to announce you, uh, Markus Nutzing and uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and Rainer Pöse. I'm sorry, it's a bit late. Yes, uh, they talk about uh, steganography in auditive uh, uh, signals. Uh, also, so embedding uh, hidden information into other uh, audio communication. And um, I think it's a very interesting topic. And uh, now give them a warm applause. So, test. And so, test, test. Gets? Okay. So, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's pretty late already and joining our lecture about configuring monitors for presentations. Now, it's about uh, steganography in auditive uh, media. And we generally present the results of our uh, research project at our University of Applied Sciences in Austria. And uh, this presentation has been created by three guys, two of them being here. This is Markus Nutzinger and me, Rainer Boisel. Um, before we start the talk, uh, I wanted to, to let you show hands of how many of you know the difference between uh, steganography and cryptography. Okay, that's quite a lot. Uh, we also included some slides about uh, what steganography is compared to cryptography. Um, I want to let you show hands once more. So, how many of you use uh, tools for steganography consciously uh, in the daily life? <laughs> it's, that's not too many, but I think it's two or three people. <laughs> okay, so let's get started uh, on the topic. So, cryptography, as almost all of you might know, is uh, the study and practice of hiding information. So we want to protect secret information. And uh, the most important thing and the, most, uh, the biggest difference between cryptography and steganography is that the data transfer is obvious. So in steganography, uh, we want to communicate over covered channels. And we want to conceal the existence of uh, secret information at all. In this context, I also want to mention cryptology, and cryptology, uh, it's almost the same as cryptography. Uh, the difference is that cryptology also includes cryptanalysis, meaning to find out if uh, a cryptographic approach has been secure. I also want to give a brief introduction on what, uh, how steganography works. So we have a cover medium, in this example, it's an image. And in this image, we embed secret information. Here it's called secret message, using a so-called encoder. And this encoder gives you a so-called stega object. So it's the cover medium modified somehow a little bit. And it represents uh, the secret information then as well. Then the stega object is transferred over the communications channel to the receiver, and the receiver can also be understood as the decoder, and the decoder is used to get the secret information back out of the uh, Stega object. Uh, some of these decoding algorithms need the original cover as well, so that's why there is a dashed line here, and we also have a key which can be uh, used to determine this, uh, the uh, places where the secret information, for example, is hidden or, as well, the data can be uh, encrypted before its transmission over the secret channel. Um, to, to give you an example of where this uh, methodology can be used, I included a map of the world. Uh, it's from the OpenNet Initiative and it shows countries in which there is some internet filtering going on. And often in this country, it's used to communicate over unencrypted channels. 
for example, GSM networks or voice over IP uh, channels as well. And this is, uh, lots of the, uh, let's say lots of these countries can be understood as those in which it can make use to use steganography as well. Let's talk about uh, the framework, as we call it, um, to identify the mature components. So this is one side of the communication, meaning it can be either the receiver or the uh, transmitter, and we provide full duplex communications. So here we have the so-called framework. It's colored, and it, it includes uh, embedding as well as extraction algorithms to modify the cover medium to create the STIG object on the one hand, and on the other hand it allows to extract in, uh, the secret information which has been embedded into uh, the cover medium. And uh, we also have a GUI, a graphical user interface, which allows us to control uh, the whole process of extraction and embedding, and we can also supply the secret information in kind of a chat. Um, we'll show you this later when we do the live demonstration, demonstration setup. Um, here we have a picture, an image, which shows uh, the setup for voice of IP. And in voice of IP we have two computers, one on the left, one on the right, both have a voice over IP client installed, and they both communicate over the internet, and to do so, they both connect to a router, and we uh, described here that, that it's a, a Linux router, and this Linux router we extended by some software, which I show you here, to modify the packets in real time. So. On both sides of the communications, we have uh, extraction and embedding going on. This is a requirement as we want to communicate full duplex so that both si uh, sides can send information. Sorry. Um, one other important thing is that we have here the so-called net filter queue. Does anyone of you know the net filter queue in Linux? Heard of it? Just show hands. Okay, that's a lot. I would say it's 30 of you. Uh, the net filter queue allows you to manipulate net, uh, networking, uh, network packets in user space. So you don't need to, uh, to, to uh, program a kernel driver because usually, and at, at least in Linux, uh, the TCP IP stack is implemented on a kernel level. And so you, you are able to modify packets in user space. So let's compare this setup to, to a setup for GSM communications. And the setup is pretty similar. So we have on both sides, like receiver, transmitter, and uh, the framework, uh, which is on both, both sides used to uh, embed information into the cover medium and to extract it as well. But instead of using routers to communicate with each other, we use mobile phones, which communicate over yeah, the GSM network, which is here displayed as just a line for simplicity. Uh, another important thing is that on the routers, we use the net filter queue to modify the packets. Here we're using the sound card, the computer sound card, and on this sound card, we plug in a hands-free set, a hands-free set of the mobile phone, so we are able to to modify the auditive information before it's handed over to the mobile phone, and we can also take the auditive information we get from the sender and to extract to, uh, the secret data. So, as we've be, I've been mentioning the framework a couple of times, uh, I think it's time to, to introduce you to the architecture uh, especially. So we, first of all, well, one of the most important steps is just to identify the tasks involved in this secret kind of, in, uh, of, of information exchange. So, uh, as mentioned before, there is the embedding going on, so we need to unify the cover medium with the secret information. 
And before we unify these two data streams, we need to uh, uh, adapt or to extend the secret information with some protocol information. So almost all of you, I think, know that in a state full protocol like TCPIP, uh, there is this uh, integrity checks going on, segmentation of data, acknowledgement, secret numbers, just to be sure that the data arrives in the correct order. So we also need components for this job. And as well, we need, uh, as in almost any software architecture, we need components for the instantiation management as well as uh, interfaces to third-party software. So now that we have identified these components, we try to arrange them in kind of a layered model as we know it from the TCP IP uh, model. And to tell you how the communications work, uh, we, start, we start at the uh, topmost layer, at, let's say at Alice, and Alice wants to transmit the secret information to Bob. So the secret information is available on layer number six in kind of bytes. And these bytes are handed over to the secret bytes, are handed over to the so-called uh, so uh, protocol layer. And this protocol layer adds some information which is required for the data to arrive in the uh, correct order. And it also represents the data in kind of bits afterwards. And these bits are then handed over to uh, the presentation layer, which is required in some embedding algorithms. So, for example, spread spectrum, we are talking about this later on, requires the data to be represented as uh, chip sequences. And these chip sequences are then handed over to the actual embedding process. Uh, for example, this spread spectrum. And this embedding process takes these chips and puts them into the th samples, which we get from the, either the routing process or uh, from the sound card. Then, after that, we have these frames. And we need to make sure that both sides of the communications start decoding uh, at the right time. So we need some synchronization. And after that, we, need, we take all the samples and put them on the bus, meaning um, get, handing them over to the routing process or back to the sound card after modifying them. After the transmission, when we've transmitted the data from Alex to Bob, the, uh, the Stego object uh, walks, or goes through all the layers in reverse order as we did it when we sent them over. Here is a brief overview of the software architecture, and mainly the framework can be understood as an infinite loop. And in this infinite loop, we take audio information from the audio inputs, hand them over to the embedding or extraction process, depending on either if we're receiving data or if we transmit it to the other side. And after embedding or extraction, uh, we hand it back to the audio outputs to, uh, to continue the transmission of data. So let's talk about embedding algorithms. OK. Um. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, as we heard uh, about the framework, um, one important um, part, of course, are the, is the embedding and extraction. And for this, um, we need some algorithms. So uh, first, uh, we want to distinguish between two parts, uh, the digital and the analog ones. Um, of course, everything is digital here, but um, we see um, the digital algorithms as those who process all the bytes or samples uh, independently. So um, every sample, uh, so like in the LSP hiding algorithm, the last bit of every sample, for example, is changed according to the secret data, um, but there is no um, uh, the adjacent samples are not um, um, looked at as an audio signal. Uh, on the other hand, um, we have those analog uh, algorithms which take some samples, for example, say 100 samples, which correspond to some time, some milliseconds, and um, uh, as we have this uh, kind of signal, we can um, process it like we can do a Fourier transformation 
or um, do some signal processing operations with it. So in the following, um, we want to look at um, those three algorithms, echo hiding, spread spectrum, and phase coding. Oh, yeah. Uh, first, um, we, uh, we, I want to make uh, clear uh, how, how do we get from the samples uh, to this analog representation. So um, we, we have uh, the ability in our framework to convert from some encoded audio data to the raw, um, raw audio data. Uh, in, in our prototype, for example, we work uh, mostly with PCM files. Um, and we have these uh, samples, and we do interpolation so to get a uh, maximum precision, so increasing the sampling rate. And depending on the algorithm, so this is um, 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 this is why we use uh, why we don't use uh, LSP because it won't work in this setup. Um, it it's uh, it doesn't matter that we first interpolate, do our manipulations, and then downsample again. Uh, the algorithms uh, still uh, work. Okay. Um, so echo hiding, I think it's pretty obvious um, how it embeds data. So it has three important parameters. Um, there's the delay. So uh, you have you define two delays. Uh, one if you want to embed a zero bit, and one if you want to embed a one bit. And of course, uh, they need some spacing uh, between them because otherwise the receiver uh, cannot distinguish between those two. Um, typical values for such delta. Um, we used about one millisecond, and uh, the delay shouldn't be too big, of course, because otherwise um, a listener would uh, clearly hear uh, some echo. And um, we chose uh, the delay to be less than 2.5 milliseconds. Um, yeah, and the third parameter is the decay. So, of course, the echo can't be as loud as the original signal. Um, it kind of depends on the signal uh, how you would choose the actual delay, so we we built in some kind of regulation. So, uh, depending on the last few milliseconds, of, on the amplitude of the last few milliseconds of the signal, we choose uh, an appropriate delay. Okay, and another thing uh, which is mentioned here is the block size. So, of course, you can't um, take one sample from the audio signal and introduce an echo. So, you you choose for example, t uh, 20 milliseconds, and um, introduce one, an echo every 20 milliseconds, and so uh, the block size gives you the data rate more or less. Okay, um, yeah, generation, I guess it's clear how to add an echo. Um, how do we detect it? Uh, there's uh, a nice um, mathematical thing called Zepstrom, so it's um, everyone knows the frequency spectrum, and the Zepstrom is just another transform domain. Um, you need the Fourier transformation for it, you need the logarithm for it, and uh, due to these, um, you separate the harmonic parts of a signal, um, echoes are harmonic parts, from the signal, and the idea is that the uh, echoes are shown as peaks in the Zepstrom, so we can analyze them. Um, let's switch to an example. So here we have, uh, yeah, 160 samples. It's with 8 kilohertz. Um, these are 20 milliseconds, some signal with an echo. Um, yeah, you have to believe us that the echo was really built in at uh, with a delay of 1.25 milliseconds. And um, yeah, the Zepstrom shows the peak at sample number 10. If you do the math, it's 1.25 milliseconds. Um, but uh, yeah, you should note that this not always works that reliable. Um, think of silent parts, think of natural echoes, which may be in the signal already and disturb the receiver. Um, yeah, so it's uh, kind of uh, tricky for the receiver sometimes to, to extract all the, all the secret data. Okay, um, next thing is spread spectrum. I think um, most of you have heard at least the term. Uh, so it's used uh, in 
yeah, for example, in UMTS uh, with the CDMA um, mechanism. Uh, so the idea is to spread a, a narrow band signal over a large bandwidth. Um, in our example, or in our case, we have bits, our signals, and um, we spread them over a larger, um, or that they need more time to transmit more or less, so one bit isn't one bit, but gets transmitted as 400 chips, for example, and um, yeah, you are slower, but you are more robust. Um, yeah, and to do this, you need some kind of spreading code, and this spreading code um, can be generated, for example, through a shift register. We do it that way, but you, of course, can also configure it manually or something. Um, and, of course, uh, sender and receiver need the same uh, spreading codes. Okay, um, now to the implementation. Um, for, uh, to, to get the data uh, onto the audio signal, we um, first modulate our uh, chips. So this is the, uh, the spreaded, the already spreaded data signal and we modulate it on, onto a sign uh, carrier. And this modulated signal is afterwards added to the audio signal. But um, what is interesting here uh, is um, that we, uh, or if you do it um, like one step after the other, you would always have to uh, calculate the sign. And we uh, used another approach. We um, we calculated one uh, sign period, one template, uh, with very, very much uh, sampling points, so a few thousand, and um, we know how long a chip, uh, how long is the duration of one chip, so the time, and of course we know the sampling uh, rate, so for every sample we get, we know um, at what time it is of, in if, if you, uh, um, compare it to, to the um, to a continuous signal. And uh, so we, we know uh, what um, point, so where in the period of one sign we exactly are. And so we just take um, the according sample and multiply it uh, with our chip sequence to uh, modulate uh, our data onto the sign. And that way we, we also can uh, do this sample by sample and don't need to buffer anything before starting the process. Okay, um, here's an example. So hopefully you don't see very much here because that's the chip sequence and it should be uh, with very low amplitude. Um, but what you may see is that the amplitude varies. So that's another thing uh, we built in uh, based on the on the average amplitude of the previous chip time. So for every chip, uh, the amplitude stays constant, um, but we measure it, uh, the amplitude of the audio signal. And depending on the last, uh, on the average amplitude of the last chip time, we set the current amplitude for the next chip time. So um, yeah, that is uh, why it varies. And um, this, uh, the above signal is added uh, to the to the audio signal. Um, and this actually does the embedding, and here we see uh, the result. Okay, um, yeah, and this uh, so this is transmitted more or less, and the receiver um, gets the signal and. Uh, of course, he wants to extract the data. Uh, so, first thing to do, uh, multiply with the sign, so with the carrier. Um, and due to the um, phase shifts, um, which were introduced uh, because of the modulation, um, you get a signal which is um, sometimes, so for one chip time, it's more in the positive values. For next chip time, it's more in the negative values, and so on. And um, those average values over chip time um, <coughs> are uh, the input for, for a correlator. And the correlator uh, matches the, 
the values which you get, like true, false, 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 true, 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 and so on, um, against uh, the chip sequences which were generated at the beginning. So there's a, a specific se sequence for a zero bit and for one bit. And the output looks hopefully like this. So the blue line is the uh, sequence which matched. So we had 100 chips for one bit and yeah, like say 47 matched or 45, I don't know. Um, which is still more than enough for, for the system to say, okay, I know this is a zero bit or a one bit. And yeah, and the other, the red line just stays about zero. So when I talk about correlation, um, you may ask, okay, but what if I miss the first chip? Of course, then the whole system is broken. Uh, you won't get any output. So big issue uh, in this whole thing is synchronization. Um, the receiver has to start at the correct um, chip and uh, which equals at the start of a bit. And um, yeah, so we have to search for, for this offset. Um, and we do this. Um, okay, maybe I should first tell something about the uh, implementation. So um, when receiving, we, we don't uh, the embedding is done in real time. And when we, when we receive samples, we put them in a uh, an extra thread, uh, puts them in a buffer, and um, uh, the main thread just processes further, so outputs that, um, the, the signal over loudspeaker or something. Um, and in the, the other thread is just for extraction, so it fills up the buffer until enough uh, time uh, is there, and the embedding engine is notified, and then it starts uh, this search process. So um, it assumes that the first sample in the buffer, so the beginning of the buffer, equals to the beginning of a bit. Of course, this may be true or not, but um, either way, um, the correlation from the previous slide is done, and you get some output. So it says, okay, uh, with the probability of 0 0.2, um, this is a zero bit or something. And um, we do this uh, for, um, yeah, and, and we have some, uh, some configurable granularity where we, uh, where we say, okay, and we try the next offset as at this and this time and from in the, inside the buffer and so on. And we do this for the whole buffer. Um, and the output is something like that. So we get a histogram uh, which shows the bit qualities over time. And, and then, uh, so this is this. And then uh, we, we have this uh, dotted line which starts at zero. Or uh, I guess it starts a little above zero. But um, the point is it, it in we increase it until um, there's only two peaks above the line. If this case is never matched, then we can't get synchronized anyway. That's how we programmed it. And um, we throw away the buffer, wait again, and start again the search. But if it happens um, to be the case, then we look at those two peaks. And for example, here, one is at 0 0.19 and one is at 0 0.47 seconds. And um, <coughs> if the, the distance, the duration between those two peaks uh, is exactly one bit time, so the time it takes to transmit one bit, which we can calculate, of course, due to all the parameters, um, then we know we're synchronized. And then um, our new offset is like this distance and we can start extract uh, the further bits. Okay, um, yeah, the, the algorithms uh, we've looked at so far um, worked in the time domain. So, as I said, there is no embedding uh, delay. We can process the samples sample by sample. Um, yeah, but uh, we also have the possibility to uh, use another uh, transform domain, in this case the frequency domain. 
Um, yeah, and for this we need the Fourier transformation, and as, as a fact, uh, we can't do a Fourier transformation from a single sample, so we get some embedding delay in this case. For example, um, we use 10 milliseconds, uh, 10 millisecond blocks, so we get the delay of 10 milliseconds. Um, yeah, and as everyone knows, when we transform to the frequency domain, we get two spectrums. Um, it's the frequency spectrum shown here and also a phase spectrum. And we can embed in either one. Um, and yeah, there's another interesting thing uh, which we implemented. Um, in the time domain, we always uh, um, modified the whole signal. So for example, the spread spectrum sequence is added over the whole audio signal. Every sample is modified in some way. Um, but in the frequency domain, um, we can choose a, a frequency interval and only those uh, frequencies are affected by our um, embedding. So for example here, from 400 hertz to 1.2 kilohertz, um, of course the negative spectrum is uh, modified as well. Um, yeah, and so we can, for example, uh, adapt the, uh, the specific algorithm to a specific channel or whatever. Okay, so how does this work? Um, in our case, we don't use the frequency uh, spectrum, but the phase spectrum. Um, but anyway, uh, the gray part is our affected frequencies, and this is um, split into two parts, and um, what is done is uh, we calculate the average value of the uh, phase values from each part, and um, uh, the data is embedded, so one bit is embedded by, um, by the phase difference of the parts, um, and further, if the difference is for us, so by the sign, more or less, by the sign of the phase difference. So we, we need to ensure a, a, at least a specific uh, difference, and the sign tells whether it's a zero or a one. Um, yeah, and we do this by decreasing or increasing the phase values as long as we get the difference. Um, one thing, uh, you, you can't increase or decrease infinitely, of course, in the phase spectrum, uh, it get, is, it's from minus pi to pi, uh, so um, otherwise it, it wraps around. Um, so we, we don't uh, modify values which are too near at the end. Okay. Yeah, an example. <laughs> so, yeah, um, you see the modifications done here. Yeah. Okay. I guess we can proceed. Uh, Ryan will tell us something about the implementation. So now that we've covered the embedding part of our uh, framework, so we've been talking about the echo hiding, spread spectrum, and phase coding, three different algorithms. Uh, I think we should also mention the, the data rate we can reach using these complex uh, algorithms. Maybe you can give us an example of... Oh yeah, sorry. Um, okay, so uh, with echo hiding, I mentioned you can um, just uh, configure the block size appropriately. Of course, it shouldn't be too low. Um, for example, we took uh, like 20 milliseconds and you get your data rate. With spread spectrum, you get the robustness um, due to the spreading. So if you take, for example, 1,000 chips per bit, you, your data rate is somewhere, uh, I don't know, very, very low, but um, it, no, no, nobody will corrupt your signal. But um, we uh, had data rates for about, um, at about uh, 1.5 to 3 bits per second. Yeah, this data rate is pretty low, so you can just use it to transmit information, short information like uh, keys for encryption, uh, which is then happening. Uh, so now that we have covered the embedding 
part of our framework. Uh, I also want to give you a brief overview of the protocol uh, sh uh, layer we are, we are using. And the protocol layer is just used to implement something which is similar to the TCP IP protocol. So the secret data is extended by like sequence numbers or uh, acknowledge the exchange of acknowledgements uh, so that we can make sure that the data, the secret data, arrives in the correct order, which is pretty important because if you think of transmitting encrypted data, uh, it's very important to, to, for every bit to be correct because if you have an encrypted block and it's just a single bit flips, everything is blown up and you can't use it anymore. So this is implemented in the protocol layer and in the presentation layer here. We just represent the uh, data which has extended by the protocol information as bits and then hand it over to the embedded, embedding process. Or in case of an extraction, the, uh, the, uh, the secret information is headed up, uh, put up to the upper layers like presentation and protocol. So to test the embedding alg algorithms, we also implemented some parts more and we call them defense parts, and these defense parts let us introduce some noise on the transmission channel. Like noise, like real noise, as you may know it, uh, know it. it's a, just a random signal with a low amplitude, and we add this to the Stega object. We also uh, try, try it around with a chitter, and chitter is a variation of the delay in which we leave, uh, let the packets go over the network, uh, frequency shifting means to, uh, to uh, put up the tones, like in semitones, so very low frequencies. And uh, signal cancelling means that we just leave out some samples on the way to its destination, meaning we, tr we transmit silence. Uh, yeah, this is not stake analysis. Stake analysis is like, uh, like in cryptology, crypt, uh, crypt analysis, tr uh, finding out if a Encryption algorithm is pretty secure. Uh, this is just for testing purposes. We just want to try how robust our transmission uh, and embedding algorithms are. Regarding the implementation, we implemented this framework on the Linux Intel platform, meaning 32 and 64-bit environments, but we also ported it to the MIPSL platform, and the MIPSL platform can often be found on smaller or embedded devices, such as uh, customer routers or uh, Soho routers, uh, in the price range of about, let's say, 70 euros. And in this case, we took the uh, ASUS WL500G Premium uh, version 1, which, can, which isn't available anymore, but it's based on the Broadcom uh, 4704 chip. And uh, we were able to port our framework using a modified OpenWRT SDK. Maybe you've heard of OpenWRT. This is uh, it's a, some kind of Linux distribution which can be used on embedded devices, such as these routers. Uh, we also think of porting this whole framework to other platforms. And to do so, we, require, we need platforms which support or which uh, provide either a, ro a routing interface or an audio interface. Uh, I also want to tell you something about this modified OpenWRT SDK. And uh, the most important thing is there is no support for NFQ. This is uh, the, li uh, the net filter queue for processing uh, packets in user space, as mentioned before on one of the first slides. Uh, but, yeah, there's a patch for that, so we added support for NFQ in the OpenWRT SDK, and we also needed to, to install additional packages, most notably is the FFTW library for FFT uh, transformation of auditive signals, and, for example, the GNU scientific library, GSL, and to be able to run this whole thing on these embedded platforms, we for sure needed to uh, adapt the firewall settings and the start scripts to fire up our framework. So we also think of porting this framework to smartphones. 
And I think this is the most uh, interesting feature. If you port this to smartphones, and if you are able to uh, attach to the raw voice data, meaning the sound card of the sm smartphone, you'd, you would be able to communicate uh, with steganography over a GSM network, meaning you have your steganography, steganographic tool with you in your pocket all the time. So for smartphones, uh, yeah, we thought of the end of Android, Android uh, powered smartphones. And the good thing is, in this case, there is the NDK. And the NDK provides a C++ compiler, which is required to compile our source code. Um, if this scenario with the raw voice data does not work, we can also think of using it for voice of IP, meaning we would need to be able to uh, modify packets which leave a smartphone using this NFQ mentioned before. Uh, now to, to bring our presentation to an end, we prepared a demonstration setup. And this demonstration setup uh, is, in my opinion, pretty complex. So we have three computers, and two of them are virtual machines. Uh, one is called Alice. The other one is called Bob. And on each of these three machines, there is uh, both the framework as well as the GUI running. So you might ask, what's the purpose of the third machine? So the third machine is this laptop itself. So it's the host. And on this host, we configured the framework in defense mode. So we take the RTP packets, which pass from, uh, Alice, uh, from Bob to Alice, and add some noise so that we can demonstrate the robustness of the transmission of secret data using steganography. Uh, what else do you need to know? There is two uh, dedicated subnets, and to these subnets, the virtual machines are connected. So let's see. Uh, here we have, so as mentioned before, the whole thing consists of two parts. It's the framework itself, which is an ordinary process, just running and waiting for connections. And then there is the GUI, the graphical user interface. And here we have the host. So the graphical user interface here is used to add noise to uh, real-time packets, RTP packets, which pass through the host. And we can do this by sliding this bar up or down. And currently, it's set to not introducing any noise. So here. We have Alice. This is the Alice uh, computer, virtual machine. And on this Alice computer, we have the framework and the GUI, as well as a uh, voice of IP client. And we decided to use a Kiga, which you might know. So, and the third and second computer is here, it's Bob. And here we have the same components as we have them on Alice. So let's fire up the GUI of, oops, of uh, our project. Here we have a terminal on which we start the framework, this process. And now it's waiting for our GUI to connect to it, so we connect, and to see if it really works, we, we implemented some comments, so we can request the configuration of the framework, for example, and to start the whole thing, we send it a start command. So now we have set up the first virtual machine, meaning this is Bob. So now we have the framework running, we have the GUI connected to it, there is the voice of IP client, waiting for connections because it's Alice calling Bob. And so we just need to do the same thing on Alice computer. So we start the GUI here as well. Here we start the framework. So it's waiting for connections from the GUI. We connect to it 
and we just stand, send it the start command immediately. Uh, yeah, it's now waiting for RTP packets to pass through. So, to do so, we start uh, Ikiga, the voice of IP phone, and we call Bob through the host computer. So it's the two virtual machines uh, communicating over voice of IP. So, and now we, before I hook off, hook up, um, we introduced uh, some WAV file so, the, so that you can hear something in which we embed the information. Okay, that's, that should be, <laughs> that's embarrassing. <laughs> no, uh, actually, <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, usually it's fast enough and uh, you can hear that there's no modif at least with your ears, you shouldn't be able to hear the modification. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Just imagine it's working, okay? Um, okay, but... Yeah. Okay, um, but, but, sorry. Okay, uh, what we see here, um, these uh, values, so this is uh, what I mentioned uh, with the cor correlation, so um, we see if the guy doesn't speak, the values are very good, and if he starts speaking, maybe there's some uh, interferences, whatever. And, uh, but the values are still very good. And what is the range? It goes from one to minus one. So uh, a one bit, the best one bit received is 1.0. The best zero bit received is minus 1.0. And the worst case is 0.0, .0 of course. Yeah, so um, this way we decide uh, which uh, bit we uh, actually received. So maybe you could show the GUI? Yes. So here we have the GUI, yeah, and, and uh, the, yeah, this tab uh, shows all the uh, interesting information from our layered model. Uh, so the uh, little TCPIP, um, we have the frames, the packets, and at the top the stream. Um, so if we start chatting, I will enter something like say hi. I will only enter, enter hi because as mentioned before, the bitrate is pretty low. And so it starts okay. sending, it's, it's putting the bits here onto these layers we mentioned before. And I will switch over to the receiver side. And, yeah, and in some point of time it will start receiving. Yeah. No. So, yeah, the, um, what happens is, is clear, I guess. So uh, the one, I guess it's Bob. Uh, no, it's Alice, which, which embeds the bits, and uh, Bob receives them. And yeah. So, as mentioned before, we also have some the defense, which allows us to put some noise into the packets. So if I put up the slider, maybe you can hear the noise. OK, uh, so now we kind of disturb the channel. And uh, what we see, uh, the values which I mentioned before go down by some factor. Yeah, it's when you uh, turn on the noise to 100%, of course, values uh, will be very bad. Uh, in this case, it's still okay. Uh, it's still um, more than enough to decide uh, what bit um, we extract. Okay. I will stop this. Okay. So this is all running, no problem. So here we have the demonstration setup, as mentioned before, three computers, all with the framework and GUI. Um, as a last slide, I just wanted to give you an outlook. So we, we brainstormed a little bit of future scenarios 
what we can do, and I think uh, it's important to have a better usability and to provide uh, the community or the, all people that are interested to be able to communicate securely. And so this could be, for example, a Windows port or uh, ports to smaller and other devices which you're, uh, which you're able to put in your pockets. So let's say thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions. Okay, there's uh, one question from the peace missions. Um, so the one is asking if there's a measure to say how to de detectable embedded messages are and is a secret required to find out if there's a hidden message at all? Um, okay, so yeah, of course there are techniques um, uh, from stack analysis. We, um, we didn't, um, as, as mentioned on the slides, we didn't uh, like try to uh, analyze something, maybe a, a follow-up project. Um, for now, it, uh, it's to say that we did our best to uh, not be detectable. Okay, my question. Um, what was the bits we see in the debug log? We see uh, there is a, a, a one or a zero bit. So for what standards is uh, when no message is sent, which bits are there? Um, okay, so it's, um, it depends on the, on the protocol used. In this case, we used the stream, um, which was shown in the, in the uh, graphical interface. And uh, if there's no data, so no chatting in this case, then it just sends acknowledgments, just for testing. Okay, then another question from Peace Missions. So the one is asking uh, for a link to the project and if this is available in open source. Uh, we are currently trying to make it open source now. Uh, it's, it's open source, but we are just working to setting all up, meaning a project page, and we also need to talk to, to the project partners because it's a funded project and to, to find out uh, how we can do it best to make it available for the community. Yeah, and uh, I had some nostalgic feelings during your presentation because tomorrow, 16 years ago, the 29th of um, December 1994, I saw a very similar presentation at the KS Communication Congress by, uh, at that time, student uh, Andreas Pfitzmann, and he built a system where you had a video chat and you could chat uh, with your keyboard at the same time and transfer information. And just out of mere interest, did you have access to, to that project? Not exactly to this one. Uh, there are related projects, for sure. Uh, for example, there is this famous paper called uh, Techniques of Data Hiding and almost all embedding uh, algorithms that, that we implemented are based on this paper, for example. It's, it's like a reference paper, but uh, it was a requirement for us to, pro to, to implement something new. So we uh, implemented new algorithms which combined these uh, algorithms as uh, present, present before. Uh, but no, to this project, we, I didn't know about it, to be honest. Um, may I add something here? Um, we didn't know about it, yeah. Um, but um, one thing, uh, most projects out there uh, use LSP, still use LSP hiding. Also, um, there are very much papers on the stack analysis, uh, but most focus on LSP hiding. So in our case, we wanted, we really wanted to focus on other algorithms. I don't know what Mr. Pfitzman used uh, back then, but um, chances are that he also uh, used uh, or implemented the whole stuff with LSP hiding. And the main problem with LSP is it, that it's not really robust. If you do, for example, a conversion between formats, let's say from WAV to MP3, or, even, uh, or the worst case is if you uh, convert the data to GSM, to the GSM codecs, 
uh, then there's no chance for LSP algorithms to survive that. And this is absolutely the case here. So we definitely want to, uh, for our, our data to survive this uh, media conversions. Okay, the last one is via Twitter. Um, they like your slides and uh, they ask uh, if you're going to publish them. Yes, we do. Yeah, uh, okay, sorry. No, no, no. no. Yeah, uh, I guess they're still, uh, they're actually uh, in the bent above. Uh, I don't know if it's the latest version, but we'll upload them in seven minutes. <laughs> so yeah, they're, Available. Um, if I understood that right, uh, the three uh, embedding techniques should not interfere with each, each other. So, is it possible to combine them to yield higher data rates or uh, add robustness? Um, yeah, um, good question. There is the possibility, of course. Um, one problem you may get uh, is the more you embed into the audio signal, so uh, the higher the modifications or the more and uh, the easier it is uh, to be detectable or at least to distort the quality of the audio signal but yeah it's I, I guess it's possible so I don't see any other questions in the audience so I want to thank you for your very interesting uh, talk yeah thanks for the audience <laughs> thank you